Okay, we are moving on. We're talking about in the book of Revelation, the seven churches, the letters to the seven churches. The seven churches stand for seven stage of advancement from uh, just being kind of a right regular guide, all of a sudden, after going through many lifetimes, the person begins to think, you know, there's something better than this, and he begins to search within himself. And the first thing represented by uh, uh, Ephesus is that uh, he breaks off from outer authority. And he breaks off from outer authority and he begins to think, boy, this is great. I don't have to be subject. I don't have to be told what to do anymore. I can just make up my own mind. And the reason he breaks off from outer authority is because he made that inner contact. He realizes there's an inner authority that's greater than the outer. But when he first begins to depend on this inner, he's, he's not focused enough to really stay there. And he goes to the uh, uh, emotional authority within himself, the desire nature. So he mixes up the desire nature with the Christ self. And he kind of goes crazy for a while and he goes off the deep end and follows his, he thinks he's following uh, his Christ self and he's really just following his desire nature. And he gets so far off that uh, the, inner, the, the inner Christ comes to him and says, hey, you gotta straighten yourself up or you're gonna, you're gonna lose your, the, the light you attained after all this time. So uh, uh, he eventually, most he eventually he does get the message and he uh, he uh, strains himself up and then he gets ready for the second major step which is represented by uh, smyrna now when uh this is introduced in uh the book it says and to the angel of the church of smyrna write these things saith the first and the last which was dead but it's now alive. Okay. So earlier we noted that Smyrna is derived from the Greek word of the same name, Smyrna, which is uh, represented by the herb mirror. Okay. So what's interesting about this is uh, mirror was a uh, 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 given to Jesus at his birth, it was one of the presents by one of the three wise men. And then his body was anointed with it uh, just before his burial. So this herb was presented at the first and the last part of his uh, mission here upon the earth. So this herb represents the first and the last. And this is what he says unto the angel of Smyrna, why these things saith the first and the last. And it says, which was dead and is alive. So what's interesting about this city of um, Smyrna is that uh, it was destroyed in 700 BC and everyone thought that it was just gone. But then uh, 400 years later, it was rebuilt by a general, uh, under, for, uh, one of Alexander the Great's generals rebuilt it and it became a great city uh, with a population of around 100,000, which was a pretty big city in those, those days. So Smyrna was a city that everybody thought was dead, but then was alive. So this city was representative of what uh, uh, the Christ was saying to John. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is now alive. So this uh, applies to the disciple. The disciple in Ephesus, he uh, gets a touch of the inner voice. 
and breaks off from the outer voices saying, I don't have to listen to these outer voices anymore. But then he goes a little bit uh, too gung hell and he, he says, I don't have to listen to these guys. And he doesn't exert any uh, self-control anymore and he just goes crazy. So he becomes spiritually dead for a period of time. But then he enters into the Smyrna state when he becomes alive again, just like the city of Smyrna was destroyed, but then it came back bigger and stronger than ever. So he, the disciple goes through this period where he goes into a spiritual wilderness for a while, but then it's not satisfying, so he comes back. And he comes back and centers himself again in the, uh, on the inner Christ. And he continues his journey better than before. Okay, so the, he, he becomes the first and the last. The last state is much more solid where his attention is more focused in the light. So he weaves back and forth until he stabilizes in the light and he becomes that which was dead but is now alive. Okay, the next thing the voice says is I know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich. And I know, I know the blasphemy of those which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So first of all, he says, I know thy works. So the inner Christ is aware of everything that's going on. He's aware of uh, your works, your problems, every, every thing that is happening and that it, uh, is needful for you. And so this is, a, you know that when you get guidance from your inner self, it's accurate. And uh, then he says, um, he knows your tribulation. So as you enter the, uh, the path, you went off the path, now you're back on, and it's not that easy. You have a lot of problems develop, and the inner Christ knows about these things. And he says, he says basically, don't worry about them. Uh, we're going we're to solve everything that comes along. And then he says he knows your poverty even. So... The poverty comes in the fact that uh, when the person progresses along the path, he goes against the grain of friends, family, authority figures, and he'll often lose a lot of, a lot. He'll lose his friends, sometimes he'll lose his job uh, as he begins on the path. People will think he's going crazy. And so this is the poverty that he goes into. And the inner Christ says, I know your poverty. I know your tribulation. I know everything you're going through. And I know how to comfort you. But when he reflects on this, he would say, it says, uh, but you are rich. And the disciple would say to himself, would I trade the riches of the spirit and communion with the inner Christ for all the riches of the world? And this gives him the strength to continue because no, he doesn't really want to trade. <laughs> even though he's having difficulties, even though he's lost friends and family and, and um, maybe his job, maybe his finances, he wouldn't trade uh, the riches of the spirit for anything once he's got a taste of them. This parable uh, that Jesus gave kind of gives us a good uh, teaching in this direction. And he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully and he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull up my barns 
and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul's soul, thou has much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease and eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul will be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So this is a parable is really good teaching for the things that are really important. I mean, we may spend 50 years preparing for that day of retirement. That may be the day it actually die and just, it would be like you did it all for nothing. So what we need to do in life is be rich spiritually. If you can get close to the inner Christ, to the spirit, uh, and have that closeness with you, you will take it when you pass on to the next world. If you become a billionaire and then die, you don't take one dollar with you to the next world. Then he makes this curious statement. I know the blasphemy of them would say they're Jews and are not, but of the synagogue of Satan. So who are the false Jews? These are people that worship at the seat of the Antichrist. In other words, they worship, they sit at the seat of authority, of unearned authority. People that claim to be spiritual, but are not spiritual. Now there's a, among some of the, uh, Neo-Nazis are the teaching among them that the false Jews are, that the people in Israel are not real Jews, that the real Jews are them. Okay. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of different teachings physically around this, but uh, what we want to look at, at uh, uh, is the, uh, uh, the spiritual interpretation of it, is that the true Jews are those that uh, uh, are close to the spirit. And uh, these represent, uh, the false Jews represent those that try to represent the voice of God to you, but do not represent it accurately because the true voice of God is within ourselves. So uh, we recognize the true servants of God when they recognize, when that true servant of God will recognize your own inner voice as being the same inner voice that he has. They will see an equality with you. Okay, uh, any comment on that? Yeah, I got a lot of comments on that. When I, when I got excommunicated, began to see a greater measure of light, all of my friends, well, first of all, I got fired from, once I was ex, I got fired from my job. I was selling real estate. And who gets fired from real estate? Yeah, for selling real <laughs> estate, the Gate City real estate. And the guy uh, was a devout Mormon that, that owned it. And he said, we can't be having that going on in the ranks. So Sorry, but we're going to have to let you go. So yeah, who gets fired from real estate? And then all of my friends in the church, uh, they became the false Jews. They said, you know, you're going straight to hell because you're not, you're no longer in the church and you're no longer worshiping the prophet. And uh, I collected about 12 letters from friends that said they could no longer associate with me in any level because I was an apostate. And uh, Neil Goodfellow, I remember him, he was one. And then yeah. uh, uh, because I chose a different path and then they just all uh, abandoned me basically and told me good riddance and that was it. It's but, funny after I was excommunicated, the whole bunch of people came to my wife and says, don't worry, we're going to love him back into the church. <laughs> and then oh, yeah. 
after about six months, I said to her, you know, uh, remember how everybody said they were going to love me back in the church, but not one person has come to visit. They're all afraid of me. And she says, this is the, one of the few times I was kind of proud of my first wife. She says, uh, yeah, you're right, and I'm going to do something about it. And the next test morning, she got up and she chewed everybody out for being hypocrites. <laughs> and she, <laughs> from what I heard, I wasn't there, but I heard a couple of people comment that everybody was just slouching in their chairs and be like they were ashamed of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing about Margaret, she could really let you have it. If she oh, wanted. yeah. She was, if she wanted to let somebody have it, she, um, she was a master. She didn't hold back. Let's take yeah, anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Go ahead. No, that, that's about it. But uh, I, I can see how that scripture totally applies. How, um, you know, you catch a little light and then you go off the deep end and you're, you see um, from your, through your emotional and astral body and you misuse your freedom and then you get back on the path and, and then you know you're you're ascending, but some would say a, a great price. But then you wouldn't change it. You wouldn't go back. You know, my dad. Even my dad said, you know, if you they kick you out of the church, I'll never speak to you again. Of course, that was that lasted about a week. <laughs> but you know, you can, once once you see the light, you you can't you can't go back. Yeah, it's interesting. I know a lot of people that after we got kicked out, a lot of people we taught, they felt the spirit once or twice, but then they reverted back, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them did. Like they lost it. They couldn't even, like they didn't even have any memory of the, of the event. But uh, so that's interesting. Okay. Any other com comments? Uh, can... Uh, you kind of identify with uh, th these two st steps so far on uh, uh, the uh, progress of the disciple? That's been um, identifying with all of them. <laughs> yeah. Like when you, uh, when you think back to steps you took, Scott, uh, was uh was uh did, did you then receive a lot of like temptations to go with your lower desire rather than your higher well um <clears throat> looking back on it i haven't uh thought a lot about it but i remember uh there were times that for example and I don't fully understand the, uh, the the first love thing. I understand what you said about it in the in the last class, but um, the, the when I got to that point where I forgot my first love and I was I was free from the outside authority, there was a tremendous, tremendous. Uh, it was like an overwhelming amount of of. Uh, temptations that just I almost became intoxicated on and uh, that's a good point because this often happens too it's not so much the everybody follows their lower desire is that there's a lot of just things come out of the woodwork to try to distract you that's a good point Scott go, go ahead let me uh, don't let me stop you there oh well I, I I just remember that that time period, and I remember coming out of it, and and uh, <clears throat> like you were talking about today, I was relating with that because I I remember coming out of that period, and there was a point in time where I I said to myself, none of that is worth this feeling right here, this what this is right here, and I was talking about my soul contact and yeah. uh uh how important that is to me and and i had forgotten that for a while and um and but everything that i had experienced and was tempted on and everything none of that became 
anywhere near as valuable to me as, as soul contact. Okay, and this is something important you did was you kept that in your memory. Because a lot of people, when they first get the soul contact, they it's like they get amnesia, almost like they want to get amnesia too. And uh, so you have to keep refreshing your mind about your the soul contact you've had until you get it again. And so uh, this is this this is uh, really an important thing to do is reflect upon your high spiritual moments on a regular basis because they will come again and energy follows thought and the more you reflect on them the more you put that energy in the ethers so uh it will happen again sooner that way okay good comments everybody we'll go on to the next verse fear none of the, those things which thou shalt suffer behold the devil will cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days but be thou faithful unto death and i will give thee a crown of life so he warns these people so after you uh, you break off from outer authority kind of go wild for a while and then you center yourself and you continue on the path and as you continue you're going to have problems surface now it's different now than back in uh, the early days of the church they really uh, really did have some uh, terrible problems surface but uh, uh, you know they were fed to the lions and tortured to death and uh, all all kinds of things but uh, so they had problems so we don't have today but we think we have problems we magnify our problems like the current virus everybody's terrified of that uh they're they're afraid they're going to lose their job if people lose their job today sometimes they'll commit suicide or maybe shoot up a postal service or something like that <laughs> and uh but uh we react to things today with uh, as strong a reaction as the early Christians reacted about getting fed to the lions. So it's, uh, uh, it's funny that even though the circumstances change, we still keep our fears uh, alive. And if we don't have a big problem, we'll manufacture something so it looks like a big problem. But uh, uh, so says the devil will cast some of you into prison but what does this mean uh it's not necessarily a physical prison but we make prisons the greatest prison is a prison created by our own minds our own beliefs and the the, the greek uh or hebrew word for devil is really adversary which means uh adversarial thought sends us into a prison of our own making and it says we will have tribulation for 10 days that's really an odd thing to say isn't it what does that mean have tribulation for 10 days like a lifetime like a long time well actually 10 days isn't very long so, uh, you can fast for 10 days without food and and uh i've fasted the longest i fasted was 12 days so you can fast for uh 10 days without food and um so it's not really a long period of time so why does he say 10 days he says you shall have now you're going to live a whole life how many days is in your entire lifetime 365 days a year so maybe like uh what 30,000 days and 10 days out of a whole lifetime that that's not very much so what he's really saying here is you'll have tribulation 10 days now 10 days as you're going through 10 days of like fasting for instance it seems like a lifetime but it's when it's over it doesn't seem like it was very much and so he says when he says 10 days, he's really saying, you're going to go through tribulation 10 days. In other words, it's a period of time that you will be able to handle. 
So don't worry about it. You, you're going to have tribulation, but it's just going to be 10 days or a short period of time, not extremely short, long enough to test you. But uh, in the scheme of things, it's, it's not going to uh, be a large price that you're going to have to pay. It just seems like a long time when you're when you're standing in ice water, you know, uh, it seems like you're there a long time, even though it may just be a short period of time. Yeah, if you're just in a cold room for an hour, an hour seems like a long time if you're cold or too hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Being tortured to seem like a long time, but it's not. Oh yeah, if you were tortured for 10 days, that would seem like a real <laughs> long time. Yeah, so. Uh, well, it, it could be, it could just seem like a long time, even though it's not a long time. So he continues, he says, uh, don't worry about this, just 10 days. It, it, in other words, you can handle it if, if you make up your mind. If, if you're not prepared for 10 days, it can, you may give up and uh, cop out. But if you realize, hey, it's 10 days, I can handle 10 days. Okay, then uh, uh, that's the attitude that uh, the dis disciple has to have here. Then the message continues. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. It's possible that tribulation may last until death. He says, be faithful unto death, or even require the seeker's life. But even in this case, it will seem short in the whole scheme of things. So no matter how long we have to endure, it won't, it'll rarely be exactly a 10 day period, but it will be a period that we will be able to handle. In other words, the voice is trying to let us know, the inner voice is trying to let us know there's a beginning and an end to all discomfort you're gonna have in pursuing the light. So don't worry about it, it will end, okay? Now let's look at the final words. Oh, well, has anyone, uh, anyone had that experience with the 10 days, like uh, you felt that you were going through something and it seemed like it was forever? Now, Godmunder, uh, are you still there? You've been through a lot of mental stress over the past few years. Does it seem like it's going to go on forever? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. So sometimes I feel just hopeless. But if you realize that it's like going to be like 10 days after a period of time, it's going to be over and you're going to be in charge of yourself. That, that, make, that gives you a lot of hope, doesn't it? that type of thinking? Yes, if, if I can act, act, actually feel feel like that. Yeah, and that, that's what the inner voice will tell you. If you've gone through a period where you're really struggling, like you've been going through, the inner voice, if you listen to the inner voice, it'll say, don't worry, this will end. And it, yes. it will um, end, and you will, you will come out on top. If you hear that and know it, would you, wouldn't you really like to hear that right this moment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's really encouraging thing. And well, this is what happens to the disciple as he moves along the path, is when he's struggling, and, and I think all of us have been there in one way or another, we've been in a situation where it seems like, uh, boy, it seemed like this is never going to end, you know, uh, might as well go kill myself. <laughs> you know, that's the way a lot of people feel at certain points in their life. But if we persevere and if we listen to the inner self, we'll say, no, it will end. Don't worry about it. Just continue for 10 days and then, then that healing will come. If you get that message, that's very, that's a very nice message to get that will give you the impetus to go on. 
this is what happens a lot of alcoholics. They reach a really bad low and it seems like their life is over and maybe they even want to kill themselves. And then they get on a 12-step program and get help. And then they think, this can actually end. I can actually take charge of my life. For, 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 for the past three years, I actually have been feeling like an alcoholic just without the alcohol. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Also, recently I've been trying to remind myself that you know, that negativity will pass. Yeah. Like, it just can't be like this forever. Yeah, that's really important to realize that it will pass. And this is what causes uh, probably, uh, I'd say almost everybody that commits suicide thinks that their life is never going to get better. That's, that's, that's kind of what they're thinking when, when they uh, have that in people that are near suicidal or just depressed. A lot of them think that way, but it's not that way at all. Sooner or later, they, things will get better. This will pass. The things they're going through uh, that are negative, and then there's situations in your life. Maybe uh, maybe the love of your life uh, went off and had an affair with somebody else and you think your life is over. Well, it's not over. It will pass. Things will get better. You'll find somebody new. And uh, just keep on persevering for the symbolic 10 days and uh, the things will change. That's an encouraging message that every disciple has to hear from his inner self as he moves along the path. And if we listen to the inner self, the inner self will always give us that encouragement to move forward. It always will do that. So always listen to that inner voice. Then it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. He that, over, he that overcometh, shall not be heard of the second death. Okay, he that overcometh. What is it that the seeker must overcome so he's not hurt of the second death? Well, we haven't picked on Ed yet today. Uh, what, what does the person have to overcome as he moves along the path here, Ed? Well, there's several things, you know, you have to overcome the, an inflated se sense of your own importance sometimes. Yeah, that's a real big one. <laughs> and you have to overcome fear. And that's now, a big one. That's a big fear one. Fear is based on a, a lack of knowledge. You don't seem like the type of guy that's been afraid of much in your lifetime. Have you, have you ever, ha have you had very many fears in your life or are you kind of feel like you're kind of at peace with things most of the time. Well, I'm not afraid of things. Sometimes I sometimes I get caught up in overthinking things, but I'm not afraid of things. Yeah. Yeah, you don't look like a very fearful guy. <laughs> but, well, you know, like I say, you know, what me worry? <laughs> <laughs> don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Curtis is another one. Uh, Curtis isn't afraid of very many things. He's uh, just my wife. Yeah, those women, they can uh, <laughs> be pretty terrifying sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. Speaking of terrifying, it's, it's interesting how the females <laughs> are so are so much have their center of power on the emotional level. We're stronger physically, the males are. But the females are stronger emotionally, and they have power to put the fear of God in us. <laughs> <laughs> then we have to go to the mind, you know, and kind of tune that out. Yeah, yeah, you have to str be strong on the mind to handle. Or else we just go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, it, high, uh, the highest, most liberating experience of my life six years ago that also gives me some faint hope oh good yeah, yeah and, and 
Well, reflect on that. Reflect on the highest things in your life and not the lowest things, but the highest things. And that will give you uh, uh, good encouragement. Then it talks about the second death. He says that he that overcometh, overcometh, like Ed says, our fears and our ego, uh, our lower desires, we overcome all these things and we will not be heard of the second death. There's several interpretations of what the second death is. The most common religious interpretation was the first death happened when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the presence of God and death is spiritual death is defined as being se separated from God. Now this story exemplifies many other stories in different religions, but uh, almost every religion has a tradition about us being separated from God in some way. And this is like the first death. And then the second death is supposedly when we go before the bar of judgment and if we're unworthy, then we're separated from God a second time. They say that's a second death. Now it goes much deeper than this. This second interpretation is that um, we're, we as a human species, and this is given out in the, uh, by, uh, uh, in the ancient uh, wisdom that we as a species on the planet Earth are progressing and will progress through a period of millions of years until um, it's time to graduate. And 60% of humanity will graduate and go to higher spheres or enterprises of endeavor. 40% will have to go to another planet similar to Earth or because they haven't progressed spiritually enough. So they got to remain in this separated condition. And this is like a second death. In other words, the, a second separation from the higher spiritual life. So they'll have to go to an earth and begin their, uh, 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 continue their progression until they're ready to move on from the uh, 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 typical mortal state. Okay, the third interpretation of the second death is that after you die, you're in your etheric and then your astral body and you have to eventually let this go. And this is very fearful for people that are not focused on the spiritual level. It's no problem for the person that has soul contact, but for the person without soul contact, they are very fearful about letting their, because after, after you die, you're still in your astral body and you have to let that dissipate eventually. And this is a second death. And uh, it's no problem for the spiritual minded, but the people that aren't spiritual minded don't want to let it go. <laughs> and they're terrified. So uh, uh, this is, so we read it for this I of mine, uh, he that overcome us shall not be hurt of this second death. Well, so, uh, spiritual people are supposed to, at the time of death, focus on exiting through their head center where the average would focus would exit through their solar plexus where you go into the the astral world but the, if we're supposed to train ourselves to exit through the higher mental part of ourselves so when we die yeah exit through as high a center as possible is what uh, some of the advice that i've heard Okay, we'll uh, wrap this up by saying Smyrna represents uh, stage two in the seeker and he's governed by ray six. This is a ray of devotion or idealism. So in Smyrna, he uses the power of this ray to raise up his ideals, uh, to live, live up to his ideals. And this causes him to uh, uh, have to suffer some difficulties and problems uh, on an emotional level that uh, will try him. And eventually he transcends these 
things and is ready to move on to stage three, which is represented by Pergamos. And I'll just read the beginning verse of this to end this uh, session. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. And we will continue talking about this third stage uh, next uh, uh, in the next class. Okay, any comments or questions before we wrap it up? What was the purpose? What does it gain you to exit your body out of a higher out of your crown chakra instead of a lower chakra? Okay, you got an answer for that, Ed? You're the one that brought that up? Yeah, and how do you do that? How do you train well, yourself to do that? Well, it has to do with when you begin to focus in meditation mm -hmm. and you, you develop over the, over the process of your evolution, you develop a certain intuition. It said that many people know when the time of their death is coming and uh, you focus in the higher center. And that takes you to the higher planes. Well, it, you know, I've often said it's like a, a, a fish tank. If you have a drop of rock in it, it goes to the bottom, but if you put a piece of wood in it, it floats to the top. What level your soul is, and your consciousness is, is to the dimension where you go when you pass away. You know, the Egyptians have the symbol that your heart is measured against a feather. Well, that's, that sort of relates to that because uh, if you're of a lower, grosser type of person, you go to the what's called the, the astral or the lower realms. It's a matter of frequency. Yeah, I think uh, Ed's got a point there, but I think also if you live centered in your higher centers, you'll pretty much automatically exit the right place but uh using your power of will it's possible to move you up a notch from where you might have exited also uh, well if you're operating from your heart center you can you have gratitude uh, for the life that you've lived you have gratitude that you're walking through a new door you're thankful that you're moving into a higher uh astral level you you know you just you just constantly thank thankful i think that's if you exit through that center then you know you're not going to feel any like ed says fear or or emotional pain and i have heard this statement which kind of impressed my impressed me uh someone once said i don't remember where i heard this but it said that uh the very last thought you have before you die makes uh, is very uh, conducive as to where you're going to go right after you die. So the very last thought. So if you're thinking something like uh, uh, something, a very spiritual thought at the moment of death, 